Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Maggie. I'm a former professional MCAT tutor and a current third year med student. If you're new to this channel, then this is a good video to watch because honestly, this is gonna be pretty representative of what we like to do on this channel. And if you've been following us for a while now, then you know from the title of this video what I'm gonna be doing. I'm gonna be breaking down some of the standalone questions in the AAMC free sample test, the unscored one. We've already gone through a lot of like the passages, actually all the passages for this sample test, and now I'm going back through and doing the standalone questions because I know that sometimes people um, will specifically struggle with those because they just require kind of a different skill set to answer than passages. If you are curious, I've already done the CP section and I've already done like the first five or so of the BB section and now I'm going to do like the next five. I think there's like 15-ish total standalone questions in the BB and so I'm breaking them up into groups of five. So while I'm going through these questions, I'm going to be uh, imploring our strategy called simplifying the question stem. Me and the other tutor on this channel, who is also my brother, John, love, love, love these test taking strategies because as he mentioned in the recent video, like me and him, we know MCAT stuff, especially as it relates to like the high yield stuff because we have all our like high yield guide, high yield courses and we've done like a lot of recent research for that kind of stuff. But, like as far as some of this like low yield material goes I don't know I don't remember this stuff from undergrad like I have flooded my brain with way too much other information since being in med school but these test taking strategies will still carry me through a lot of these questions so if you want to know as little as possible to do well on the MCAT you have to be stellar at these strategies. If you're curious, all of the strategies that we like, we have a whole playlist called strategies um, on YouTube and you can watch all, the, all those videos. And we might be going back and like redoing some of them because they're like kind of shite quality and stuff like that. So just be on the lookout for that. John also started doing like a kind of advanced level strategies sort of series. And so like that's going to be something that's really good for all those people who are not happy with like, you know, a 510 or 512 or whatever you want kind of those 520 scores then yeah you're gonna have to be really solid on the test taking strategies fortunately it carries through you know the rest of undergrad and med school and stuff too without further ado this is question 29 of the sample test it says the figure below shows a population growth curve for a bacterial colony before and after the addition of a polysaccharide and it shows us right here which of the following most likely explains why the bacterial colony did not grow immediately after the polysaccharide was added so if we're simplifying this question, what we're not going to do is simplify this bottom part right here by saying, okay, well, this says, why did the colony um, not grow immediately? Like, we're not just gonna cut out words. We're not just gonna rephrase. We are actually going to like take information in our brains, take information usually from the passage, but in this case, we don't have a passage, of course, but we do have a figure. So take information from this figure and actually formulate like a basic science way of asking the same question. The MCAT people, they don't care about like the specific bacterial colony, right? They care about the, the fact that you can logic your way through certain things or that you know these very specific basic sciences. So what they do is they come up with this question. They either just test your logic or test the basic science and then they add a bunch of fancy words and they make it complicated just because they can. So don't let them do that. Simplify the question down. Let's, let's see. Let's look at this figure. It says the number of bacterial cells over here and time right here. So we see that we add the polysaccharide right here when the bacterial colony was about this much and there's a delay right you add it right here and then it doesn't start going up until about right there and so then we see the growth curve increase so now what we're asking is what why this what's going on and this is actually just going to be a complete logic question. We'll look at the answer choices right now. A says the bacteria that were unable to digest the polysaccharide died. If that were the case what would the growth curve look like? It would probably drop down okay right because like there's going to be bacteria that die and then there's going to like there is a scenario in, the, in which this answer case that i can consider this answer choice to be true and it's that you had this rapid burst of bacteria that grew when you added the polysaccharide and then you had the exact same amount that died and is that is that the case whatever i'll put a little maybe beside it just to humor us all 
But we're going to find out that there's a way better answer choice that you probably are already thinking of logically in your head. So we'll put a maybe beside A. B says the digestive enzymes for the polysaccharide had to be transcribed and translated. One, would that create this growth curve? Yeah, right? Because there would be a delay and when you have to make these digestive enzymes. And so you would see this like flattening off, like, like you wouldn't have any growth and then suddenly we get the enzymes to digest this thing and so the colony would grow from that now. All right, so the, the growth curve checks out, but does this make sense? Do you have to transcribe and translate digestive enzymes for polysaccharides? Yes, right, you have to have enzymes that break down polysaccharides into monosaccharides. We do this in our gut all the time. The bacteria in our gut do this. Everything does this. There are specific enzymes that break these long chain carbs down into smaller ones so that they can be utilized for energy. So B is the correct answer there. And it just makes like, you can say like, okay, there's like one very specific scenario in which A would work. Okay, but B just like plain old makes sense. Like you can't mark B out for any good reason. That's just the reason why it's better than A. C says the hydrolysis of fatty acids is a slow process. What that got to do with me? Fatty acids, polysaccharides, two totally different things. D says the polysaccharide directly inhibited bacterial fission. That would mean it would go like that. No, like it would just like, you just, bacteria would die because they die all the time and then they, nothing, if you're not fissioning, then you're not ever going to increase your colony size. So B is the correct answer. The next question says, if the GAPDH gene is continuously expressed, where is it most likely found? Okay, simplifying the question. This does not matter. It's saying genes that are continuously or constitutively expressed. Look at these answer choices. What it's asking is what kind of DNA can be continuously expressed? What kind of DNA can be continuously transcribed? And the answer to that is going to be euchromatin. Remember the, the kind of like opposite of euchromatin is heterochromatin. Heterochromatin is DNA that's like really tightly coiled. And so literally the proteins that help you with transcription and everything cannot get into the spots that they need to get into to help transcribe, you know, the mRNA or whatever. Euchromatin is like looser and so the proteins can fit in there and so you can get transcription. That's all that this question wanted you to know. They needed a fancy way to ask if you knew the difference between euchromatin and heterochromatin and whether you knew that euchromatin is the one that can be transcribed. And so they came up with this question right here. You do have to know what telomeres and centromeres are. Telomeres is like, I'm not going to go too much into it because this video gets super long, but like the telomeres, is like the end of the gene that like prevents it from degrading when you have all this like DNA replication all the time and the whatever. And then centromeres, that's like in your mitosis stuff. Neither one of these like telomeres or centromeres are like involved in transcription, I think at all really okay the next question says which amino acid is neutral but zwitter ionic at ph7 despite possessing two nitrogen atoms in its formula so i think one they're testing whether or not you know what zwitter ionic means and that just means that there's a positive and a negative charge at, at two different points two distinct points in this molecule and then they end up canceling each other out and so they're neutral so honestly like this is like it's neutral but it's neutral at ph7 like they're just saying the same thing over again despite possessing two nitrogen atoms. So we can go through these. We need um, amino acids with a two nitrogen atoms and that's neutral at pH of seven. You should, by God, if you don't know by now that you need to know amino acids, if you've ever watched another video of mine or John's, we talk about all the time you need to know your amino acids. I mean like know them, like be able to draw them if you just hear them or if you just see the one letter code or the three letter code or whatever. So glutamine is the first one. So do does it have two nitrogens? Yes, right? It has the, the amino terminal group and then it has like, um, its side chain also has a nitrogen in it. So that checks out. Lysine, um, does that also have two ends? Yes. Uh, tyrosine does not have two ends, so two, two nitrogens, so we can mark that one out. And then arginine, doesn't arginine have more than two nitrogens? Ah, I counted it in. It's not the right answer anyway. It has at least two nitrogens, right? But then you have to know these charges as well, and you should know just like quick off the cuff that lysine and arginine are both positively charged at a pH of seven, and glutamine is neutral, and so that's the correct answer. The next question says the individual cells making up a tissue differ from single cell organisms such as paramecium and that only the latter. Okay, so it's just asking like 
Paramecium is, I don't know, I'm assuming it's a eukaryo, like a single-celled eukaryo, whatever. I don't, rem I don't remember bio one or bio two, or I don't even remember where I learned that at some point. But we're asking, like, think about individual cells as in like um, eukaryotic cells in our body. Like, how are they different from something that can live as a single-cell organism? I'm sure there's several differences. They don't come to mind, honestly. So I'm going to look at the answer choices to try to, you know, uh, spark my memory. A, reproduce by mitosis. Do single cell eukaryotes like paramecium reproduce by mitosis? I'm guessing. And the individual cells in our body definitely do. I know that. So, nah, I mean, I'll put maybe just because I didn't really know it, but I, I think they both reproduce by mitosis. B, have subcellular organelles. Well, that's, that's the entire purpose of being a eukaryote, right? Is that you have organelles. So no. C, are capable of extended independent life. Single-celled organisms have to be because that is how they live their entire life. You know, I don't know how long a, I don't know how long a paramecium lives. It can live for 100 to 200 cycles of fission. I don't know what that means. But the individual cells in our body, are they capable of extended independent life? If I cut off a piece of my skin and I lay it on the counter, is it going to continue living? No. So that is a difference. D can metabolize nutrient molecules. They both can do that. They, that's part of being a cell, whether prokaryotic or eukaryotic. So C is the difference, are capable of extended independent life. Our individual cells are not, and I don't really know why, to be honest. Maybe it has something to do with like nutrient transfer. We're just not built like that. We have to have blood. I don't know. The next question says, when a striated muscle cell metabolizes glucose in the complete absence of oxygen, blah, 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 anaerobic respiration, which of the following substances is not produced in a significant amount? So, okay, we're, we're saying with anaerobic respiration, which is not produced in a significant amount. So what this question is really asking, if we simplify it down, is probably which one of these is only anaerobic rather than both aerobic and, and anaerobic. So pyruvic acid or py pyruvate, it, whichever one, they're the same thing. It just depends on whether or not you have a, the proton on there. That is the like final product of glycolysis. And if you'll recall, anaerobic respiration is just glycolysis and then aerobic is like glycolysis plus other stuff. So we have both of those and like both of those will go through the process of glycolysis and end up making pyruvic acid or pyruvate. B, glucose 6-phosphate, that is the like very first step in glycolysis. And again, both of these involve glycolysis, so no. C says lactic acid. So so lactic acid is not created in aerobic respiration because you can use that pyruvate that you get at the end of glycolysis and shuttle it into like, you know, Krebs cycle, oxfos, all that type of stuff to get more energy out of it. Whereas in anaerobic respiration, you just convert it to lactic acid and, and you know, re you get back your like NAD or NADH and then you can, then you have all this lactic acid left over as a byproduct. So that is only in anaerobic but what we're asking is only anaerobic but what we're asking is which one of these is not in anaerobic and the correct answer is that acetyl coa is not in anaerobic respiration acetyl coa is what pyruvate gets turned into before it enters into the krebs cycle so there's like a little transition step in between glycolysis and the krebs cycle and it's when you make acetyl coa and so if you're just doing anaerobic respiration then you won't uh, go through that extra step to make acetyl-CoA because <laughs> giant cocoa is back because you're just going to convert it into like lactic acid or um, like ethanol or whatever the other form of it of anaerobic respiration is. That's all I got for you guys for this video. I'm honestly sorry. I feel like I rambled a lot during this video and like I'm feeling a, a bit uninspired. I'm Sorry, I'm just tired. I've been in the hospital all day. But I do hope that I made these standalones a little bit clearer if they were fuzzy for you before. Please, 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 guys, first off, like and subscribe to this channel and share it with a friend. Like, me and John love this channel and, like, love contributing to you guys' education and you guys' growth. And we truly believe in the mission and that's why we keep doing this. But we do get, like, a little tired, a little uninspired at times. And so, like, comment down below what you want us to like what you want to see share this video with a friend ask them what they need with their mcap prep that kind of thing and i will keep doing these passage breakdowns and these standalones and we'll keep doing our strategy videos and like everything that we think that like that we would give our students if we were tutoring you one-on-one -on -one. but i want to keep this material like 
fresh and updated for like the newcomers who are taking the MCAT now because I know that my information is starting to get outdated. Like I took the MCAT like three years ago. And there are also people out there that learn differently than me and they have like different problems when they are going through the process of studying. And I want to hear about those because I want to help. I just, I we want to help. We're fortunate to be in this position that we're in and have the audience that we have and have like such caring people like commenting on our videos and stuff like we are really truly blessed but in our eyes like this is like a two-way dialogue like I don't want to just be talking to like some faceless camera all the time um, I want to hear from you guys like what you want to see from me <laughs> my cat probably just broke something but like seriously think the things that you guys email to us the things that you guys comment that directly feeds into like the videos that we make so don't ever be shy for asking for more of what you want. We just love the engagement and we love to see it. All right, I'll get off my soapbox and stop rambling so much, but I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.